Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Heather Gornick. I'm at the Cleveland Clinic, and I have the honor of being here with Dr. Manesh Patel of Duke University and Duke Clinical Research Institute to talk about the Euclid trial. Welcome, Dr. Patel. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, first of all, as we get started, why don't you just tell us why this trial was important? Yeah, as you know, you know, patients with peripheral artery disease of the lower extremity are, are very common, over 200 million such patients worldwide. Yet our evidence base is pretty limited in these patients. Mm -hmm. You know, our last trial that informed us about antiplatelet therapy, for example, in these patients, probably the largest trial was the, the Capri trial 20 mm -hmm. years ago that, that in that subgroup showed us clopidogrel is probably better than aspirin. But we haven't had a therapeutic trial in these patients for a while, and our practice has changed. There's more revascularization, and probably the background therapy has changed. So Euclid's important because it gives us a contemporary look at PAD care, and it tests one of the novel or, let's say, recently uh, more potent antiplatelet agents, ticaglor, compared to clopidogrel in these patients. Okay, and then this was a late-breaking trial just presented this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you start off by telling us about the study design? Yeah, uh, it's been an honor to present it on behalf of sort of all the investigators and the patients <laughs> that participated in the study. And the study design was a, a large, uh, event-driven, randomized trial that included patients with peripheral artery disease defined in one of two ways. The first was symptomatic, and they were all symptomatic, uh, symptomatic patients with PAD who had an ABI that was reduced. And they had sort of two enrollment visits, 0.80 at the first one or less, and 0.85 at the second, or a symptomatic prior revascularization that was greater than 30 days out. The reason for that is we were using a monotherapy design, you mm -hmm. know, ticaglor monotherapy versus clopidogrel. There were a couple of important exclusions then. You couldn't have a requirement for dual antiplatelet therapy, and you couldn't be CYP2C19 homozygous, thought to be a cause for not being effectively um, treated with clopidogrel. The primary outcome of the trial was cardiovascular death, ischemic stroke, myocardial infarction, and the primary safety endpoint was Timmy Major Blue. Okay, and tell me, um, remind me of the, the study groups and what the two arms were of the trial? Yeah, so Ticaglor 90 milligrams um, um, uh, twice a day versus clopidogrel once a day, antiplate therapy, and all the same rest in all these PAD patients, randomized to see how they did for these cardiovascular events. And the findings, um, um, you know, we learn a lot whenever we do these trials, mm -hmm. and the findings show that the trial was fairly neutral. Uh, in fact, the kaplan meier estimate for the primary endpoint was in 12.5% of the patients treated with clopidogrel and 12.5% of the patients treated with ticaglor a hazard ratio near one. Wow, at how many years of follow-up? About 26 months, okay. 14 months in enrollment, about 26 months of follow-up. So overall about 40 months. Um, median follow-up was about 30 months because of the enrollment time. Um, the primary safety endpoint, major bleeding, occurred uh, infrequently, but was 1.6% in both groups again, so fairly similar. The composites of that primary endpoint, cardiovascular death and myocardial infarction, were actually similar between the groups. There was an intriguing reduction in ischemic stroke in the Ticaglor group. Somewhat hypothesis generating, we'll have to sort of follow mm -hmm. that, but um, overall showed us that both drugs reduced events to that rate in those patients, but there's still an event rate in these patients with PAD. Very high. Yeah. Um, tell me about aspirin. Now this trial did not have an aspirin mm -hmm. arm, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we thought a lot about this and talked mm -hmm. about this, right? And, and, and a lot of people, including the guidelines, have said an antiplatelet agent should be used. And, and there's been, at least, you know, as a previously a meta-analysis about aspirin's effect compared to placebo, and then we sat and thought, well, what will advance the field? Um, clearly, aspirin's being used in a lot of patients. Capri at the time, and at least as the background, showed us that clopidogrel was, in fact, in that PAD subgroup with the totality better. And it's important to recognize this interesting feature that not everyone might know. Clopidogrel is the only monotherapy indicated by regulatory bodies for PAD. So aspirin actually doesn't have that mm -hmm. indication. So if you're a new drug trying to get that indication, and you have this, let's say, potentially more potent drug, we thought, that's what we did. We would have loved to have had a third arm. Of course, that's a lot more patients mm -hmm. and therapy. So for those reasons, these are the two arms of the trial. So a negative study. Um, tell me, have you started to look at s subsets, or what are your future plans to look at subsets? Yeah, so you know what we've said is, how do I interpret this, and what are we looking to do? And I would say, first and foremost, um, you know, we, we often say that peripheral artery disease is a systemic manifestation of atherosclerosis. We should consider it a systemic manifestation, but the biology here seems to be somewhat unique, and maybe we need to study PAD patients more. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me be a little bit more specific. You know, clearly, clopidogrel was an active comparator that was effective. Ticaglor was comparable. Now, it may be a reasonable alternative in some patients that can't get clopidogrel, but we'll have to see how people see that. But what this also taught us is we shouldn't be extrapolating data from patients with coronary disease to peripheral artery disease mm -hmm. or peripheral artery disease to coronary disease. In fact, in this population, median age about 66, and the population sort of had an ABI around 0.68. A third of them had coronary disease, 
but two thirds didn't. They were low extremity PAD. Huh. So, you know, I think what we're starting to do is understand what's the natural history of some of those cohorts, what's the rate. The other thing I didn't tell you is we looked at limb endpoints. Mm -hmm. Acute limb ischemia requiring hospitalization was also similar between the groups. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna investigate what revascularizations happened and how we learned about the trial and how these patients did. Well, as someone who takes care of PAD patients, I know, um, I think I, I was a little bit disappointed sure. not to have an exciting new treatment for yeah. PAD. Um, one other question, you mentioned that you needed to do genetic testing in order to enroll in the trial. What do you think about the generalizability of these results? Is it problematic that uh, we didn't study all comers and excluded people who we knew would be non-responders? So, you know, I think it, it made a higher bar for Ticagalor to win. You know, one way to think about this was this trial was designed for the new drug to have to beat clopidogrel on its best day. It wasn't generic. There were no patients with genetic mal... Uh, and so if it would have been effective or reduced, in, though no one would have been able to question is it as good as it could have been, right? Mm -hmm. The generalizability of these results now that we know these findings, I think, are still fairly large, but they tell you that clopidogrel is probably an effective but active comparator. However, if you're not routinely testing like we're not routinely testing to C19, it does raise a little bit of question about these. I'll just say there were only about 600 patients excluded for that, so it doesn't still account for the, the potential difference that we would have needed to have a significant difference in the trial. Um, I'm going to ask you just to step back. I think this was the first PAD-specific cardiovascular mega trial, which was very exciting for those of us in the field. And tell me a little bit about enrollment. My understanding is it, w we, it did very well. Yeah, so I would just say that, you know, um, it tells us of how much investigators, patients, and the clinical community wants answers in this area. We were able to enroll roughly 14,000 patients in 14 months and then follow them for 26 months. So like a lot of things in medicine, I will simply say um, the reason we do these trials is because even though we might think we know the answer, we have to get the answer, and we have to figure out faster ways to get more trials of PAD patients to answer these questions. And I think maybe send a message to our colleagues in pharma that these patients want to participate in trials and the physicians want to enroll them in trials. Absolutely, and there's a still a significant unmet need. Absolutely. Well, Manesh, Dr. Patel, oh, thank you so much for taking the time and congrats to you and your team on the Euclid trial. Thanks for having me.